Let Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. Seems like a lot of things are coming and going. You know, the football games, they come and then they go, and then the fairs, they've been coming and going. But I think fall came and it went. And I wish it would come back because when I went and took a walk this morning, it felt like the middle of summer once again. I sure hope we'll get some cool days. But I'm glad that you're with us tonight. I hope you're comfortable where you are. We're so glad that you can join us. I'm Amanda McNaughty with Clemson Extension, and we're here with Making It Grow, SCETV's own gardening program. We come to you live from historic downtown Sumter. And we're going to answer your gardening questions. We've got a toll-free line. We hope you'll get your questions all written out and call us up. We'd love to try to help you with any problems that you're having in your land, on your landscape, or in your garden. Um, we have a wonderful time taking trips that we can share with you some of the fun places in South Carolina. And this time we're going to go to a beautiful garden that combines wonderful plants and also some pretty dramatically beautiful chickens. Oh, isn't life just grand? And we've got wonderful people inside to help answer your questions and entertain you tonight. So let's go inside and meet our guest. It is grand to be in here, and we are always so happy to welcome Teresa Lott. And as I look around, she's not where she's supposed to be. Teresa, what's going on? <laughs> Hello, Amanda. You are right. I am in a different location, excited to be here at the side counter for something just a little bit different this evening. But don't you worry. If you wanted to join the chat room, you can still do that because Extension Agent Vicki Bertinelli will be in there to answer your gardening questions and of course you can share your advice also. If you'd like to join in just go to the Making It Grow Facebook page as always click on the green Let's Talk icon and you'll be directed into the chat room and I bet people are chatting away already. Now it's Halloween in just two weeks and if you haven't had a chance to um, decorate yet don't worry because there is still time and it's become tradition for us here on the set of Making It Grow to have the McKenzie triplets with us so we have Brooks, Carolina, and Sarah Hayden here with us tonight to show you how you can make a spooky monster eyeball Halloween topiary. Now, girls, before the show, we talked a little bit about what a topiary is. Who remembers what a topiary is? I do. Oh, Sarah Hayden, what is it? It's a sculpture made out of plants. Exactly, a sculpture made out of plants. And so we had to give it a little spin and turn it into something Halloween related, but super easy to transform just a clay pot into a great Halloween decoration. Now, girls, I understand that your costumes weren't ready for the show tonight, and I'm so disappointed, but tell me, Brooks, what are you going to be? I'm going to be an Eiffel Tower. An Eiffel Tower? I can't even imagine what that costume would look like. <laughs> And uh, Carolina, how about you? I want to be a hipster. A <laughs> uh, hipster, ooh, sounds groovy. And uh, Sir Hayden? A genie. A genie. Oh, can you grant me some wishes? Sure. Oh, I can't wait. Now, we're sad that we can't see the costumes tonight, but I hope that you'll send us pictures and we can post them on the Making It Grow Facebook page. Girls, what school do you all go to? Royal, royal Elementary. Royal Elementary. Well, I hope some of your Royal Elementary classmates are out there watching us tonight. We're going to get started with a few preliminary steps. We need to put on some ribbon 
add some moss around the bottom and we also have to start putting on our wiggly eyes. But don't you worry, when we come back, we'll show you step by step how you can create your own monster eyeball topiary. Amanda, back to you. Well, thank you so much. And we are always thrilled when the calendar rolls around once again. And we have these lovely young ladies with us. It's delightful to have them here. Um, it's also delightful to have this lovely young lady. Um, Morgan Sass is a former extension agent, and she studied horticulture. And then she went back and studied business. Got a master's in business, didn't you? That's right. Amanda. And so now you're associated with? Now, Amanda, I work for Ag South Farm Credit as a credit analyst in our Orangeburg branch. We have branches all over South Carolina and Georgia. and we focus primarily on agricultural lending. So I'm still in the agriculture sector, just on the finance side now, not production so much as before. So you're still helping farmers? I am. Well, that's it's, wonderful. It's and we're so glad that you I came tonight really to help it. us. Well, thank you. And Mark Arena mm -hmm. is um, now our pecan specialist. And Mark, um, I think that people don't realize, but that's a pretty important crop for some of our South Carolina farmers, isn't it? That's a significant crop in South Carolina. It continues to increase. So. It's, it's doing well, thank you. Well, and everybody loves them, too. Everybody loves them. Get ready. They're coming now. <laughs> yep, that's true. All righty. And we're also so happy tonight that we're going to be joined by our favorite professor at the University of South Carolina, who is also the curator of the A.C. Moore Herbarium, and that, of course, is none other than Dr. John Nelson. John? Hello, Amanda. Good to see you again. I'm delighted to see you, and we heard that you had an extra four-legged pal there today that your sister dropped her dog off, too. It's like a kennel over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sure hope you don't get any fleas. But I, have, um, I was reading, I was looking at a picture of flea bane, a little, look like a little fall peak aster. Um, maybe you can get some of that. <laughs> um, John, you perform such a wonderful service for the citizens of South Carolina because you tell us what we've got if it's a flea bane or, a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or anything else that's in the yard. And if somebody has a question about something they've seen on a hike or that's popped up in their compost pile, What's the best way to get that to you? Well, Amanda, if somebody has an unknown flea bane or maybe a leopard's bane or a bear bane or whatever, just uh, send us a picture if you've got one. And you could send that as an email attachment uh, right to my email address. Or if you're close enough, um, you could just drop, um, drop something by. I have a lady who's coming by tomorrow morning with something for me to look at. Oh. And... Um, <clears throat> It's real easy, and um, you know we'll figure out some way to get your mystery plant and take a look at it. All righty. Well, and we will be happy to come back in just a little bit and um, see what the mystery plant is that you have us for us tonight. Okay, it'll be a very beautiful one from the beach. Ooh, I can't wait. Thank you. We'll see you in a little bit. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Okay, and we've already got a call. Sandra's calling us from Easley. Sandra, thank you for calling us tonight. How can we help you? Thank you. I have uh, some fresh cuttings that I've rooted from rosemary, oh. and they're about four or five inches high. I have them in pots now. They're growing well, and I just need to know, do I need to keep them in pots, or, or can I set them outside now? I just, I just need to know what to do till... In, you know, to get them to grow into bigger plants. And I'm going to hang up and listen to your answer. Let me ask you real quick, are you okay. going to try to have like a little part tear, I mean a little hedge of them, or did you just going to have them sp spaced here and there? Uh, I'd like to have like a hedge, like in the middle of my drive, okay. sort of spaced together. Well, let's see what the experts okay. think. Um, okay. Morgan, you... um live in kind of a sandy part of the world where rosemary <laughs> grows real good. What yeah. would you think she'd want to let them get a little bigger or what would you do? I'd say if you have space to keep them in the containers and keep them protected that would be fine but if they're growing and they've established a root system rosemary is fairly cold tolerant so you could probably go ahead and put them outside. Um, she might could just put the containers outside and if it got really cold she could bring them back in until they get a little bit larger but I think they'd be fine to go ahead and put out. It's a pretty cold tolerant plant and it's just a pretty tolerant plant of most growing conditions in South Carolina. Yeah, and it's so much fun because it has flowers a lot of times. Oh, beautiful nothing flowers. Else. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and it's so much fun to cook with it, too. It is. It's a great yeah, plant to have in the landscape. Mm -hmm. Chris is calling us from Lugoff. Talk about sandy soils. Chris, y'all have some <laughs> sandy soils over there. Is that one of the things that you mm -hmm. fight with? Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, what else is going on that we might be able to help uh, you with tonight? Okay. Uh, is it too late to sod grass? Too late without to... Without grass? Okay. Well, let's see. Um, <laughs> That's getting close to the deadline, but 
being down in the, the lower Midlands parts, I mean, I'd get it established. He's still got time, and if we stay above 60 degrees, it'll, it should root. So. It'll root on in. Yeah. Um, because the most down here, he's going to be putting in a, a warm season grass yes. that'll be going dormant. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd recommend doing a soil sample, too, making sure the pH and nutrients is where it needs to be versus just adding an amendment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And um, that can be very easily done, get that soil sample done, because it's kind of expensive to sod, so you might as well do that $6 <laughs> test and um, yeah. maybe save yourself some grief in the long run. All right, um, we're going to check back in with Teresa and find out about wiggly eyeballs. Teresa. As you can see, the girls are hard at work on their monster eyeball topiaries. The ribbon has already been added to the terracotta pot, and now they're working to adorn the outside with a little bit of moss, just to give it that little lifelike quality. We're going to keep working, and when we come back, we'll show you step-by-step step how you can make your own. Amanda? All righty, and we're waiting for our next caller. And while we do that, um, we're going to learn about this important crop that's um, that you are now helping people to grow even better than ever. And do you say pecan or pecan, or what do you say? I try to say pecan. <laughs> okay. Um, but we know that it's a favorite of, of, of gardeners, and you said yeah. there's one particular problem that, of, that people, commercial yeah. and homeowners, have. Yes. Unfortunately, due to our environmental conditions here, the hot, humid weather that we have in South Carolina, uh -huh. It's a very conducive environment for a fungus that gets on the pecan tree. It affects both the foliage and the nut, and it's typically called pecan scab because when it infects either the foliage or the nut, it looks like a scab lesion on either oh, one of those two. Okay. So by affecting the leaves, how does that cut back on the quality more? Well, first and foremost, uh, uh, the leaves will drop and shed and it'll reduce its photosynthetic oh, intake, okay. uh, which is basically the plant's ability to produce energy. Mm -hmm. And it needs the additional energy to produce the nuts and keep them healthy and vigorous and so they can ward off insect and disease pressure also. So it's taking away energy from the plant because the fungus disease needs food to eat, so it eats off the green tissue. And then you've got some nuts that look yep. like they're not too healthy either. All right. As I said earlier, it affects the nut also. And it gets on, on the, the husk here. Yes. And the disease can actually penetrate through this protective barrier and get into the nut, which is inside the, the shell here. And so it can affect oh. the nuts. And uh -huh. uh, that's one of our primary reasons that you see hollowed out nuts. And a lot of yeah. people complain this time of year that their nuts are on the ground uh -huh. and they're hollow. So that's one of the primary reasons that sometimes a pecan won't produce. Well, um, you know, if you're a homeowner, pecan trees get kind of big. I just don't imagine there's much right. you can do. It, it's not common for homeowners to be able to treat for this disease, unfortunately, just because of what you said, the scale of the tree, and then secondly, the equipment needed, the investment, and the cost of the equipment, and the fungicides are also expensive also. Mm -hmm. So typically, we see homeowners, it's about every year, seven-year cycle that they get a good harvest. Oh, that's a long time to wait. It is yeah. a long time. Well, now, a young bride like Morgan, if she wanted to put some <laughs> out, are there some resistant varieties that she might choose from? There are resistant varieties coming out every year, and I'll, I'll remind our listening audience that resistance doesn't mean foolproof. So when you get these trees, the resistance will vary between them, and we have some great HGIC fact sheets available okay. at the Home and Garden Information Center that uh, list the resistant varieties, and okay. we do recommend planting the more resistant varieties, and that's a natural way to combat this disease so it doesn't plague the tree. And also with pecans, is it kind of like blueberries? You need to plant more than one variety yes. to get good pollination? Yes. Usually recommend at least two, if not three. But some people, there's usually enough pecan trees in the neighborhood that the pollination, <laughs> the pollen's there. Readily there are available. a lot of them in my neighborhood. Well, thank yeah. you. That was very interesting to learn about that, Adam. I'm glad that our commercial growers have some things they can do because I just love pecan pies, and it's getting time to do that. Um, Anna Kay is calling us from Prosperity. Hello, Anna Kay. How are you? Hey, Amanda, thanks for taking my call. How can we help um, you? I have about 20 golden arborvita that are about two and a half feet to three feet tall. They've been in the ground about two years. Uh -huh. uh, I looked at them today, and the limbs are turning gray. Uh, I found a worm. It looks like a mini earthworm, a gray, pinky gray worm about two inches long. And about big around is a pencil lead Goodness. on the plant. Uh -huh. Now, each one of these plants are getting eaten or done something to. I don't know what it is. So the foliage is 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 disappearing. Uh, 
it's dying. Dying? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can rub a, your hand down the limb and it just falls off. All the needles. It's dead. Okay. okay. All right. Um, it's not but something. The rest of the plants are live. Okay. All right. Well, let's see if we can find something for you. Is this something you've heard about recently, Mark? There are several uh, fly larvae and a uh, moth larvae that will eat on arborvitae. I wish we had an opportunity to ask her if there was an abundance of the, of the larvae on the arborvitae. Mm -hmm. But the arborvitae also will get a needle blight disease. And um, the folds will turn yellow, then a dark brown, and then start to defoliate. If, if it is the insect larva feeding on there, a, a pyrethrum would be a good preventative, but you could also wait two weeks and probably they'll go through its life cycle and they'll turn into whatever their adult phase is. And then uh, typically, if it's not, the damage isn't too bad, the arborvitae will recover. Okay, all right. Um, so she could go to her local store and find something that was labeled for use yes. and make an application that to control yeah. the insect. And yeah. I imagine if she took a picture and um, put it on our Facebook page, Vicki Bertinale is, a, is yeah. kind of our bug gal, and I think yeah. if you could get a good picture with your phone and put it on there, I think Vicki or one of someone else who knows more about that would be more than happy to help you identify it. I would do that first, and then mm -hmm. we can um, help you from there. So um, I hope you don't lose it. See, they're so pretty and bring such color to a garden. Well, right now we've got some colorful kids over here and they are doing some pretty zany stuff. So let's see all about this wonderful way of making a pretty crazy topiary. Teresa? Thanks, Amanda. We have been hard at work. Right now the girls are trying to decide how they would like to fashion their monster eyeball antenna. So while they're working on that, if you would like to join the chat room, there is still time to do that, and I know Extension Agent Vicki Bertinale is there, and she can uh, answer your questions, you can share your expertise, your advice, or you can just hang out and watch the conversation. So, um, girls, how, how is the craft going? Good. 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 Is it difficult? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, 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 A little bit <laughs> difficult, but you are doing an excellent job. Uh, what, do you, uh, what, what do you think you fashioned there? That's an interesting way to put your eyeball on. You've made sort of a loop? <laughs> yes, I am. Uh-huh. So everybody has their own creativity that they're able to express. You can probably already see that they each chose different colors for their topiary. So we'll come back in just a little while and show you how to put them all together. Well, they do have things in common. They are lovely young ladies with beautiful manners, but they are certainly distinct personalities, so I'm not surprised that the finished products are going to look mm -hmm. a little different. Um, we have another distinct personality, and that is our dear friend John Nelson. And right now we're going to learn about the mystery plant. John, what you got for us? Well, Amanda, um, we have a really nice mystery plant tonight. It turns out that I was able to go to the beach this past weekend spent a couple of days, uh, had a family reunion, and my father's 90th birthday, so it was quite a party that we, um, we had, and uh, I guess it was Saturday night, we all strolled down to the beach um, to take a look at what was going on and also get our pictures taken, and while we were on our way, walking through the dunes, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we saw a beautiful, beautiful plant with big yellow flowers. It's just wonderful. This is a perennial species and um, it blooms at night. Uh -huh. So it's one of these nocturnal blooming uh, species that probably attracts moths as pollinators. And <clears throat> the uh, flowers are, are uh, quite showy. And uh, there are some other things down there like uh, camphor weed and some uh, sunflowers that also had yellow uh, blooms, but nothing really quite um, matched this one. It really is a, a gorgeous plant. has four sepals, has four petals, and it has, I think it has got eight stamens, and then it's got a style, and you all remember what the style has at the end of it, stigmas. Stigmas, yeah. Four stigmas, so Whoa. everything seems to be in fours. And um, <clears throat> by the um, at, in the morning, the flowers will close up again. So this is really one for the uh, night owls to take advantage of. Uh -huh. But also, it's really pretty, you know, before and uh, before it gets too late, and then 
if you like to walk around on the beach, this is a, a real fun one to go look at before it closes up. It is awfully pretty. It's a little luminous, very, very beautiful. I'm sure it was pretty down there with that beautiful pink sky. Well, <laughs> what do y'all think it is? I don't know the proper name. We used to call it beach mallow. Beach mallow, okay. Yeah. I'm not actually sure. I was at the beach this past weekend. I wish I'd been on the lookout for it. <laughs> well, John, does Mark get a, a ding-a-ling-a-ling? -ling? He, was he close enough? Well, I'm afraid he's... Thinking no, of something else. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean on this one, because it's not really mallow. I know what you're talking about, but all the mallows that we have would have five petals. Yeah, it has to do something with four. This has four. So, oh, goodness. Um, one this of those little, botanical differences. <laughs> Well, what is it, John? For something. Well, it's a primrose. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. An evening it's, primrose. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. Since it's on the beach and it blooms in the evening, we call it a uh, beach evening primrose. And, and um, it's easy to find. And there's a pink one earlier in the year that blooms on the railroad cut, isn't there? <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's a different species. That's uh -huh. probably Enothera uh, speciosa, and uh, it's, it's not the same species. The same no, place. but also a primrose. Well, um, my uncle, Lassane Smith, um, and his golfing buddies would come home from playing golf, and they would go stand around my Aunt Liza's little garden, and they would bet a quarter on whose flower was going to open the first. And they would stand out there for about a half an hour making bets and passing money back and forth with evening primrose. So it's kind of amazing how, um, how flowers become important in our life. And we kind of That's weave right. them into the stories that are important. And we wish your father um, a very, a little bit belated birthday. Um, I know he was thrilled to have his beloved children down there with him and that y'all are so lucky to still have him and be able to go places and enjoy life together. <laughs> we are surely uh, lucky for that to uh, all be true and um, we look forward to many years with him yet. All righty. Well, we will look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so very much. All right, Amanda. Bye-bye. Right. Lee is calling us and he lives in Aiken. Lee, we're so happy to hear from you, and is there something we might be able to help you with tonight? Yes, I, I want to speak with the pecan man a minute. Uh, I've got a pecan tree that's about 15 years old, uh -huh. 25 foot high. Uh, it's been barren about five years. Uh, first, I, I didn't get any pecans because of squirrels. I saw that problem. <laughs> Last year, I didn't get any pecans because they turned black, right? about the side before they started open, and there was no good in any of them. Uh, this year, a lot of the green ones are falling off on the ground, and uh, I've gotten a few good ones, but I don't know why the green ones are falling. All righty. Well, um, as Mark said, I guess the, about the best we can hope for is every one year out of five. Seven. Seven. Oh, Lord, it's even worse than I remembered. But what do you think is happening down there? And um, he's got them black. Last year they were black. So, And then this year the green ones even have fallen. All right. Well, there, there's two issues going on. Well, there's three, actually. We're having some stink bug pressure right now. Oh. And then there's the aphids, the black aphid on uh, the pecan tree, and then the disease pressure. But the pecan tree is really smart because if it knows it's not going to produce the nut, it aborts the nuts and saves the energy for the following year. Really? So it's a built-in mechanism to drop the nuts prematurely, uh -huh. uh, especially if the, the tree knows they're not going to fill out and make a nut. So that's what he's seeing. He's seeing the tree abort the nuts. In a, Good heavens. So in other words, if the plant just kept on and on trying, yes. it would use its reserves and yes. then it would go into the winter in a weakened state exactly. and not be able to come out yes. full strength next year. Yes. Well, that's pretty fascinating, mm -hmm. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, plants yeah. are smarter than we usually give them credit yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, they sure are smart because we plant them anyway, even though only once every seven years are they going to give us those great. Mm -hmm. But you know, they, they're pretty in the yard. Oh, they're beautiful. They really yeah. Yeah. Um, and you need to call us back, Lee, and tell us that how you took care of the squirrel problem if it was one that was legal in Aiken County. <laughs> <laughs> Gwen is calling us from Beaufort, and we're delighted to have a call from down there. And how can we help you tonight? Hi. Um, yes, I'm calling about lantanas. I live down here in Buford, and they're so beautiful. And I was wondering, is it a good time to transplant them? Is it okay to transplant them right now, or right. should I wait until spring? All right. Well, let's see what Miss Morgan thinks about these lantanas. Well, I found that it's nearly impossible to kill lantana for <laughs> one, right. so I think that any time of year would be fine. You know, I've seen some grow straight through the winter. Typically, they do die back. Um, depending on how cold it gets where she is, she could do it now. Spring would be ideal, but, you know, 
like I said, I've not really seen many lantanas that weren't doing very well. So well, and it's sometimes just a real hardy plant. This yeah. is a nice time. If you know, if, I mean, if we get another cool yeah. day, it'd be a good time to go out and work in the garden. I like working in the yeah. garden now. Yeah, I do too. And and you know, technically, it is a perennial. Um, though sometimes if it doesn't get really cold, it'll it'll continue growing all yeah, winter. Yeah. So if you transplant it now, the roots would probably continue growing and um, it probably established pretty well. All righty, and you'll mm -hmm. have those beautiful flowers yeah. again next year. Um, Leonard's calling us from, woo, way up there, Wall Hollow. That's a long way from Beaufort. <laughs> Leonard, and um, are y'all getting any chilly weather up there? Oh my goodness, um, we've lost Leonard, I'm sorry to say, but we have not lost this bunch of women we got over here, so we're gonna go over there and see what these gals are up to now. Goodness, goodness, we have been hard at work making our monster eyeball topiaries. Now, if you'd like to make this at home, you don't need too many craft materials. You're going to start out with a terracotta pot, some decorative ribbon, some moss, if you like to add a little bit of that uh, lifelike character to your topiary, some glue, of course, acrylic paint to paint the different colors on the eyeballs. Now, if you'd like to add the bloodshot fixture, then uh, you use some puffy paint to do that. We also have some chenille stems, or you might call them pipe cleaners, and those are going to be the Crazy Monster Eyeball Antenna. So that's pretty much the materials that you'd need, and we are going to get ready assembling. And while we're assembling, I thought you might like to know a little bit about the triplets, and so we'll ask them a few questions so you can know a little bit about each one of them. Now, girls, let's go ahead and start putting our topiaries together. So we're going to start with the biggest styrofoam ball first, right? We have three different sizes, so let's go ahead and collect up the largest one. Now we painted these ahead of time. We hope that they'd be dry, but they're not quite. So if you notice any of the eyeballs falling off, we do apologize, but the paint's not quite dry yet. So we're going to stick one of the small lollipop sticks in the top of there so that we'll be able to fashion the medium-sized one on the top. So stick it down, oh goodness. Oh, Got to use that strength in those arms, huh? If it helps, you can put the ball on the table. There you go. And then you're going to stick the end onto the piece that we have in the clay pot. Very good. Not too far down. We want to make sure we can see that eyeball, huh? So as they're continuing to add the pieces, right, you know what to do. You're just going to keep adding them in the right order. Let's see. So, Brooks, um, what hobbies are you involved in? Um, dance. Dance? What kind of dance? Hip-hop and tap. Hip-hop. Now, those are two very different dances, aren't they? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, good job so far. Did you get it on there? Oh, I think we accidentally poked it down, didn't we? That's okay. We can always fix it later, and this one might need to go in just a little bit farther. Use that muscle. Okay, then can you add the next size? How are we doing over here, Carolina? Good. And do you Good have one. some hobbies? Oh my goodness, we got paint <laughs> all over. Don't worry. You can be as messy at home as you like. You know what? Sometimes it's fun and it's okay to get messy. Very good. So Carolina, what are your hobbies? Gymnastics and dance. Gymnastics and dance. So you're pretty athletic, huh? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Very good. And Sarah mm -hmm. Hayden, how about you? Um, art and writing. Art. And I heard that you like reading. Mm -hmm. Are you reading any books right now? Mm -hmm. What book are you reading? The Blood of Olympus. I, what, say it again? The Blood of Olympus. The Blood of Olympus. <laughs> oh my goodness. That sounds like something very, um, very adult-like. <laughs> Goodness! Is it, what is it about? Um, God. Uh-huh, so is it about, is it Greek mythology or Roman mythology? Both. Both? Oh my goodness, sounds way above my head, and she's only in the fourth grade. So our topiers are coming along. I think, Sarah Hayden, if it was a race, you won, didn't you? Can you turn that around so everybody can see? <laughs> oh my goodness, that is quite a creation, and I see it has um, how many antenna up there? Three. Three antenna on her topiary. We're still doing a little bit of work on the others. It's very difficult because the paint is not dry, so they're trying to be very careful about not getting their hands dirty. Do you need some help? <laughs> that one, that one, we might need yeah. to push this one in a little bit. How about, let's see, have you ever grabbed an eyeball before? 
<laughs> no. Oh my goodness. I'll hold this. Can you push that stick in a little bit more? Very good. Yeah. All right. Well, while we finish the, the last touches on our topiaries, we're going to turn it back over to Amanda and the panel to answer some more of your questions and look for the finished products later on in the evening. Well, this is a lot of fun, and, um, and I like getting paint all over myself. As long as it's not on your clothes, you're perfectly safe. Um, we have Doug calling us from Charleston. Doug, thank you for calling us up. And um, do you have an interest in someone particular tonight? Well, I do. Thank you, Amanda. Um, my question is for Morgan. And uh, I wanted to say, in spite of her husband saying, I don't have a good green thumb, I had a great crop of tomatoes this summer in six pots in our driveway downtown Charleston. And I'm wondering what to do with my great big planting pots. I have six of them in my driveway full of soil. Should I replant something in them over the winter, or should I start out all anew with fresh soil next year? Well, um, I think that we, um, you know, Morgan is a, a new bride, and I believe this is your father-in-law, and he sounds very, very, very nice. <laughs> he is, and I can attest to the tomato crop. It was far better than ours. Well, so. that's wonderful. And in downtown really Charleston, life is not fair for gardeners, is it? <laughs> that's right. Well, he sounds like he's gotten the bug of gardening in, the, in his driveway in those containers pretty bad. What do yeah. you suggest he do? Well, sometimes, and I know this is probably not the the first recommendation from a plant pathologist but if I didn't have any disease problems on my plant this year I'll try to keep them and and you know if you're buying potting soil it can be expensive if you're digging up soil somewhere it can be heavy to move around I may not have anywhere to put it in his situation if you didn't have any plant diseases I would say go ahead and use it again I've used it two years in a row and had and had great success. But, well, um, is he thinking about putting a winter crop in? Is that what you think um, he wants to do? Yeah, winter crop or just saving them for next year, I think. So okay. um, there are a lot of things you could grow small. I like leafy greens. You could grow in those containers. Um, I grow those after tomatoes a lot. Lettuces, spinach, things like that might be good for containers. Yeah. You got anything to add to that? I like the early winter crops I do too. also. So yeah. yeah, the lettuces and onions and some other things would be good. And um, you Keep know, I've, productive. I've found something that's real easy is arugula, yes. and um, and it's got a nice zip to it. And if you just put a little mm -hmm. bit in a salad, oh, yeah. um, then you've got you can really make your salad much more interesting. And um, I just ordered some arugula seeds, and I'm sure mm -hmm. in Charleston you could find them. <laughs> um, John is calling us from Lexington. Um, you've got some mighty good vegetable growers <laughs> over in your part of the world, John. And um, what is it that you're working with that we might be able to give you some advice on? Well, I'm glad we got them because I don't. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I put in uh, a couple of raised gardens a couple of years ago, filled them up with uh, Virgo uh, potting uh -huh. mix for gardens, fertilizer. Did did wonderful. Oh. This year I added another fresh bag, mm -hmm. mixed it up, yes. planted a typical thing, uh, peppers, tomatoes, tried some, you know, uh, uh, carrots, radishes, so on and so forth, and I got nothing overall. Mm. I, I do not, now I, I don't have a lot of sun where they are. I think I've got enough, but, you know, I just, okay. well, the green was beautiful. Yeah, did, did they come up? Did the, every, did the seeds all come up? Well, the, the, the radishes and the carrots did not do uh, well, I can't say what I want to say because we'll, you'll be off the air and I'll be in jail. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't want to go there. Yeah, but no. okay, yeah, but okay, but um, just, all right. Tomatoes didn't produce, uh, peppers didn't produce, uh, I, I, I don't know what happened. Okay, and how many years was it since, since you first established these boxes? Uh, I think, believe this was the second year, and then, uh, like I said, I added a new bag of... Uh, okay soil plus fertilizer. Well, I don't know. Anybody, I mean, there's so many things that can happen to vegetables. Does anybody yeah. want to venture a guess as to why it's such a terrible time? My first <laughs> guess is always moisture management. So uh, it was cold and wet. Too wet, too dry, more, more likely too wet seems to be a, mm -hmm. the biggest Especially common Especially if he didn't have much sun. It sounds like he's, yeah. you know, and so the soil may not have dried out as much as it should have. Yeah, it's a possibility. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just a shot in the dark. But, yeah, yeah typically mm -hmm. most gardens fail from too much watering. And, um, and we did have, it was cold and damp for mm -hmm. a long time. So. Well, one other thing I want to add is probably not a problem if he's only been growing for two years, but it kind of goes back to the previous question about, you know, reusing soil, and it same goes for raised mm -hmm. beds. Uh, you definitely want to practice rotation if you've had issues. Uh -huh. um, Even if you're not. So, yeah, I mean, I, mean just, I, I think I would yeah. like to know more details about exactly what the plants did. 
um, you know, to try to determine if it was nutritional or what was going on. Mm -hmm. But definitely in the future going forward, make sure to rotate between plant families and um, I won't go into that too much, but you know, yeah. tomatoes and peppers are in the same family, sure. so definitely don't grow those after each other. Mm -hmm. Try to rotate that with the, some of the other crops you mentioned he was growing. And um, Roger Wynn in Prosperity, who, I mean, Little Mountain has such a, the most beautiful garden I've ever seen in my life, has told me that um, carrots and beets can be kind of hard to get up. Yeah. And um, he actually puts down a, um, some kind of soil cover, I mean, a fabric of some sort, mm -hmm. the first week because um, he said if they don't stay consistently moist. So, yeah. again, that's apparently, I mean, we think that'd be so easy, but apparently some things take a little more um, fine-tuning than others. So um, you might want to check and, you know, read a little more about things, and I hope that next year you will have a better time. We've mm -hmm. got Randy calling us from Rock Hill. We'd love to go to Rock Hill. <laughs> and um, Paul Thompson, of course, does such a great job up there. Randy, what's happening we might be able to help you with? herbicide that will take care of hen bit oh. that won't hurt my centipede grass. So you have hen bit, could you have a problem with hen bit usually, and you have centipede grass? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, well, what do y'all recommend? <laughs> I don't know that one off the top of my head. I always have to go to the reference book. Well, and I think, up. yeah, but um, I think it may be that in Rock Hill, I don't know if we've had, if we've passed the point of no return for a pre emergent or not, um, because it has been awfully warm. Yeah. Um, there certainly are pre-emergents, I believe. Isn't mm -hmm. that right, Mark? There are, I'm, I, like Mark, I can't remember well, the names well, off you, top yeah, of my head, yeah. but mm -hmm. I, you know, henbit is one of those first plants that we first, we notice yep. in the lawn, even before the grass greens up, it has pretty little purple flowers, and um, I know pre-emergents don't work for a really long period of time, so you'd probably have to, to reapply between now and you know, January, February. I think they mm -hmm. on the bag often say seven weeks or eight weeks. And again, um, what I often tell people to do is even if we were gonna, we don't give usually chemical recommendations, but because um, part of it depends on what you can find in your local stores. Um, I go in and if things, I, I peel the scotch tape that holds the label down and, and read it. And, um, yep. and you probably have someone there who's, who's um, may know what's available in the stores. If you call Paul Thompson yep. at the York County um, Extension Office, he's very knowledgeable and I think he can give you some advice and help you get that hen bit under control. Um, we went to the PD Poultry Show last year. I just my, I'm just waiting to have more chickens. We had chickens once, and um, I'm waiting for my life to calm down enough to do it again. And we met this fascinating woman there, and it turned out she not only had the most beautiful chickens, she has one of the most beautiful gardens. So let's go and visit with Vicki Dawson in Camden, South Carolina. Vicki Dawson learned her love of plants and of critters from a German governess, and now she plies those trades at her garden in Camden, South Carolina. Vicki, it is a joy for us to be here with you, and your garden I was interested in because you specialize in hydrangeas, but not just the mop heads. Tell me about these beautiful hydrangeas that are blooming right now in the dead heat of summer. Oh, the paniculatas are terribly, terribly reliable, as you know and they are much more hardy than the macrophyllums. And I love them because you can preserve them, you have color when nothing else is blooming. Long since the macrophyllums have gone. And uh, now you've got these, this beautiful color that changes and you get pinks and greens and whites and you know, you can dry them, they're wonderful. And one thing that I like is so people are so afraid of cutting their hydrangeas oh, when to prune, oh. but these, you need to be aggressive with the pruners. Tell us about that. You cut them way back in February every year, way back. I cut them back to two buds on the current growth, of this year's growth. And you can take all of those cuttings, stick them in the ground, and that's where all of these hydrangeas have come from. Because I normally only buy one of everything. <laughs> And in addition to having this wonderful color and beauty in August, you've also developed parts of your garden, which gets a lot of shade, to have glowing plants. So tell me about some of the love you have for plants that have different colors of foliage. Oh, I love the blues and the greens and the yellows. Uh, the light green, the chartreuse. I use uh, the enoki cypress that has a lot of chartreuse green. The um, blues, the Carolina sapphire is hard to beat. It does make a very large, large bush, shrub, 
Um, and uh, so will the Anokis. We have some Anokis here that I think you'll see. Um, they are wonderful. Then they come in all shapes and sizes. The one I have here that has done so well is a cultivar called Cripsy. And it's an English cultivar. And you said it started off very small. Very small. And I bought three of them. And little guys, because they were very expensive. <laughs> and when they got to be about this tall, something, a branch broke, and I discovered that I could root them. Aha. Uh -huh. So I gave some to my son that are at his house in Atlanta. I planted more in that corner, more up where the chickens are. And uh, I just thoroughly enjoyed them because they light up the world. You've really been a frugal gardener, and this grass that you're growing, or in the grass family, you say multiplies and multiplies. Tell me about this wonderful acorus. This acorus is, you can't beat it. it acorus comes in many forms. This is the large form. It's acorus gramineus ogon, and it is an evergreen grass you do not have to touch. That's the beauty of it. You don't have an ugly mound of something in the winter. Mm -hmm. You have beautiful grass. You don't have to worry about it. It lights up the world in the winter because you have this bright yellow. And it will hide very carefully underneath things for the summer that are deciduous and give it shade and then be very happy out in the, summer, in the winter sun. And you found that in, with water, if its roots are in water, you can have it in full sun, but can you use it in a shadier area? You can use it in a shady area if you water it and it will grow bare root. All these are growing bare root, and they help to clean the water for the koi. Uh -huh. They take the nitrates out of the water. And so that, because the fish that you have here certainly look very healthy. <laughs> well, they are, except we've had a raccoon digging in the ponds, muddying them up. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks they look very healthy. And when very we tasty. arrived today, I was so amazed I said, surely that can't be impatience because we're having this mildew problem and we can't have impatience. And you have a great story to tell about those. They're back. This place used to be the impatience capital of the world. I would swing blade them. They got to be three feet Woo! tall at the end of the year. <laughs> in that bed, in all these beds, in all these rocks, all around, all up underneath the shrubbery, all impatience. Two, three years ago, zip, I'm watching them implode. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is this? So I went online and I went and talked to some of the local nursery people. Powdery mildew, downy mildew, virus, nobody knew. I said, uh-oh. Well, impatient seed will stay dormant for a long time. And I had no impatience here for two years. But I got scratching around this <laughs> late this winter and drew some leaves back, and especially in the cracks around the ponds and out front and up they came from dormant seed. And I don't know how many years it'll last, but it certainly oh, is beautiful this year. I'm enjoying it while it lasts. I think you should. And of course, you and I met at a poultry show, yeah. and I was just so amazed at the beauty of the type of chicken that you had. And so tell us about these remarkable, beautiful, beautiful birds. I raised um, Buff Orpingtons. That's an English breed. Now, I do have Belgium imports that have been crossed into American lines. So we got a lot of hybrid vigor. And they're a giant gold chicken that was bred to be a very good layer. And then when it got to be four to five years old and it wasn't laying enough anymore, it would feed six for Sunday dinner. They're huge. They're very large. My, my cockbirds will go 15 pounds and the hens will go nine or 10 to 11 pounds, some of them. And this is an heritage breed and you are interested in improving the breed. Right. So tell me how you do that. I show and I selectively breed. Um, I haven't brought much new blood in because I did an outcross. I haven't brought any blood, new blood in. Um, but I developed th three or four lines within my lines. Vicki, I understand you're leaving this garden for a new place in the country. And I hope that someone will come who will love this garden like you have. And I wonder if perhaps in a couple of years we can come and see what, you, what beauty you create under the pine trees. I want you to come and see it because right now it is all pine trees <laughs> and it's going to be fun lighting up the woods with some interesting color. And, um, and I hope the chickens are very happy in their new home. I think they will be. Their chicken palace is almost ready. <laughs> well thank you again for this wonderful visit today. Anytime. One of the most wonderful things we do, we get to go around and meet fascinating people. Vicki Dawson, those wonderful chickens and that beautiful garden. And she 
once um, she won best of breed with her mastiff at the Westminster Dog Show <laughs> one time. Um, we just have some pretty remarkable people here in South Carolina, and I hope that you enjoy meeting them as much as we do bringing them to you. Um, we have a call, Janice from Grovetown. We're so happy to speak to you, Janice, and how can we help you? Yes, I'm calling because I have Bermuda hybrid grass, yes. and I'm trying to find out my neighbor's property lines are so close on both sides, and I've been treating brown spots. So I'm trying to find out, is it time for me to stop treating it? I've been treating it every two weeks for the whole summer. My goodness. Um, well, there are a lot of, how did you have it diagnosed, Janice? Yeah. Um, I sent it to my local extension office, Trip Williams, yes. in Appling, Georgia, and he's, he told me that's what it was. He had me to measure it, and I sent some photos and everything on my email to his email. Well, um, gosh, it sounds like you've really been working hard on this, and I'm sorry that you've had this problem. Does anybody have any advice for them? They're just very diligent. If it hasn't responded. corrected itself or responded by now, I think it's either not the right product or there's, it's been misdiagnosed or there's something else going on. Mm -hmm. So I would say maybe go back to your local extension office, get that reevaluated, and just let them know what you've been using, that it's not working because if it's not working, it's definitely time to stop. For yeah, the season because the grass just, will be going dormant yeah. soon. So definitely stop for for this year and then you know reevaluate again next year. And um, I don't know if he sent it to the plant problem clinic. Sometimes we think we see something and then, but if we send it to the plant problem clinic, they can do a more detailed diagnosis. So it might be that that's something you'd want to consider. Um, Mark, the one thing that people I hear sometimes talk about with warm season turf grasses is if they had had huge problems with fungal infections, uh -huh. that a fall application of a fungicide sometimes can help. Right. Um, not this different from this situation. Mm -hmm. um, is that, is, am I correct in thinking that if you had a terrible time last spring that you might want to consider a fall application? A lot of times the, the spring and fall environmental factors are the same. We're getting cooler, the days are getting shorter, and we're getting more rain, so I think it's an environmental issue. But I, I typically don't recommend doing anything without proper diagnosis and then yes, making sure diagnosis, it's an issue. Yes, diagnosis, yeah, yeah so. absolutely, diagnosis. Otherwise, you're just wasting chemicals yeah. and putting a chemical out for no purpose, and that's and that's not there's no point in doing that. Beth is calling us from Hepsibah, Georgia. What a beautiful place, at, at least a beautiful name your, um, your community has, Beth, and I hope it's just that pretty. Is everything beautiful in your yard, or can we help you with something tonight? Uh, everything's wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. And But I had a question about... A eucalyptus tree that uh, I bought, and I, I've seen them in different people's yards, but you rarely see them. But when they grow big, they're beautiful, and they smell so good. And mine is young, and during the summer, it was growing really well. I've got it in a white, big pot, I mean, a bucket-like. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's starting to act like it's... Um, kind of dying on me and I was wondering if you had any tidbits or information you could give me. <laughs> Woo, and you've got it in a in a planter right now, not in the ground. Right, right. It's not real big. Uh -huh. Well, it wants to be big one day and um, Morgan, what would you recommend that she do? She's got it in a planter and it's not looking real good. Well, depending on the size of the planter, I'd probably go and put it in the ground. Um, that's probably the problem that's just being the root growth is being restricted. You know, watering a plant in a container, you have to be really careful with. And um, just be real particular how much you water and you fertilize. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that also they want to get big and they have a pretty rapid growth rate when they're young, don't yeah. they, Mark? Yes, definitely. I mean, it's a fast growing tree. and. You know, my first thing was I wonder if the container even has a drain hole in it. There you go. So. Yeah, yeah. So I would get it in the ground. Um, Alice is calling us from Fort Mill, South Carolina. Alice, we're glad to talk to you tonight. Um, what can we help you with? Well, I'd like to tell you I enjoy your program very much. Well, we thank you for those nice words. I'm calling about my tall garden flock. Tall garden flock? Yes. They do very well. Mm -hmm. And they're very robust. And then it seems overnight they wilt and die. My oh, goodness. So they bloom for you? They bloom beautiful. and they're robust uh -huh. and they're just beautiful. And then it seems within, it seems almost overnight, each stem, one by one, they, the, first the leaves go 
and then the plant goes, and then the next day the next stem goes, and oh, before goodness. you know it, the whole plant is dead oh, within several days. So have they, they've not been coming back? You've had to replant? And, and, and it doesn't come back. Uh -huh. they, they're just dead to the ground. Well, that's a bummer. Because my fox are doing great, you know. Now we've got these, you know, powdery mildew-resistant fox, and it really let us all have beautiful flocks. And thank the Lord that hadn't happened to mine. Oh, please! Um, has anybody heard of a problem like this for flox? It sounds like some kind of rot is going yeah, it's, on. It's definitely one of the root rots. I don't know which one, but when a plant dies that rapidly, it's typically a root rot issue. Um, and so how would you go, I mean, do you think that she's got a heavy soil perhaps up there in Fort Mill and they're not getting enough drainage? Do you think that could be it? That could be part of the equation. The other part, I don't know how much she's watering it. She didn't specify on watering uh, regimen, but mm -hmm. it, it definitely sounds like a watering issue. And as Morgan said earlier, I mean, if, if we're seeing a continuation of the flocks dying, it might be time to put in a different plant and yeah. give the soil a rest. And if you have a, a sprinkler system, that can be the worst thing in the world yes. because really you need to go out and use your, your, your best tool that you've got with your finger to figure out when to water. So that would be one thing that you could consider next year. Feel the soil before you make a water. You know, we just love our friends on the Your Day program. I'm, just, I'm so happy when I have some place to go in the middle of the day in the car from 12 to 1, Monday through Thursday because the Clemson Your Day program is so great. And on Wednesday, um, October the 15th, that's tomorrow, Jonathan Veet, I hope I'm saying that, is going to talk about insects and other critters and leaves and what happens when fall comes, how they adapt to the changing weather. And he's even going to give us a forecast of color, which really does sound fun. And then on Thursday, um, just the next day, another great treat because Corey Tanner, who of course is in Greenville, and George Dickert in Spartanburg, two of our finest county extension horticulture agents, are going to get together to answer your questions. And I'll tell you, they'll know an answer. Um, I always am so happy when they're here because it's like having these smart people. They make me feel so at ease because they have a great wealth of knowledge. Be sure to tune in from um, 12 to 1 every day and, um, and catch that great program that the Your Day people put out for you. Okay, um, we want to thank Teresa so much for being with us, and I know she's going to have a special thank you for her dear friends. It was certainly my pleasure to be here. I did miss my chatters, but I heard you had an exciting night with at least 17 chatters in the chat room. And big thank you to Extension Agent Vicki Bertinelli for taking time out of her busy schedule to host from home. I know those chatters certainly benefited from her expertise. I had a blast with you girls making our eyeball topiaries. Now, Brooks, we were talking in the break, and what did you tell me about yours? It's having a bad hair day. Oh my goodness, it does. That kind of looks like how I look in the morning when I get out of bed. Can you, do you look like that when you get out of bed in the morning? A little bit. A little bit. I think you're probably beautiful right, right from the time you get up. And Carolina, yours kind of reminds me of um, something we'd make in the wintertime. A snowman. It does look like a snowman, I think, because you added the, the uh, antenna. But arms. I guess here they're sort of like arms, aren't they? Yes, Now, can you tell everyone, how, how can you make it wiggly uh, if you'd like your antenna wiggly? Okay. You get a pen and you get your thing and you just wrap it around. Now everyone knows out. our secret, don't out. they? So a pen, a pencil, a marker, anything will help you get that nice curly Q look. And Sarah Hayden, look at that. It reminds me of a movie. Monsters Inc. Monsters Inc. And who was in that movie? Mike Wachowski. Mike Wachowski. The bottom green one kind of looks like him. It looks awesome and it's exactly what I thought of was that movie when I saw yours. And I have mine as well and um, I don't know, there's nothing too spectacular about mine. It's just kind of plain Jane compared to all of yours, isn't it? Kind of. Kind of, yeah, look, they don't, they don't want to admit that theirs looks better than mine. Well, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Don't forget to send us those pictures of you in your Halloween costumes. And I hope all of you will be sure to join us on the Making It Grow Facebook page all week and have wonderful experiences in your garden. And if you feel like you're being watched, that's because we have our eyes on you. Amanda? Woo, woo, woo. Well, that gives me the, the shivers right now. Uh, Mark, um, thank you for making the trip down. You had a hard time in this bad weather. Um, we needed rain, but not that kind of rain, did we? Uh, that was fine. That was an exciting ride down. Oh, Lord, help us. <laughs> and um, I want you to get one of those Maddox and Tic Tacs because you're going to need it up there in that red clay. Thank you so much thank for you. being with us tonight. And um, I wanted to say quick thank you to Jay Crouch. who brought me these beautiful feathers. 
And, um, and celosia was in my head. And you said you like to grow celosia more? I love celosia. That's probably one of my most favorite flowers. It just doesn't look like a flower should look. And that's what I love about it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> well, and they hold up well, too. They do. And Great that's always nice. Base, yeah. Long, yeah, wonderful cut flower. Um, and we enjoyed having you with us, and we will look forward to being with you again next week. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.